think it's about time. So, uh, hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. Uh, my name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit your questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And then we'll have some time at the end to address the questions. Today's speaker is Martin Maus. He's a professor of African linguistics at Leiden University. And his research focuses on the description of Cushitic languages, including Raku and Alakwa of Tanzania, as well as exploration of language and identity, valency changing verbal derivations, and Bantu languages of East and West Africa. Marte is now starting a new project funded by the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research titled Unraveling East Africa's Early Linguistic History. So please join me in welcoming Marte as he gives his presentation, The Iraku Imperfective and its Challenges to Morphology. Well, thank you, Anna. It's, it's lovely to be uh, introduced by you uh, with uh, our voices through cyberspace and sitting on a cloud. Uh, so I'm talking about the Iraku imperfective, and that is something I have been working on for a long time. And uh, that is probably partly because it is a, a very complex issue. And now I get to the first slide, yes, <laughs> to uh, some challenges with my old laptop. <clears throat> so what is the issue? In Iraku, imperfective meaning is expressed by a range of different morphological processes. So I'll try to, to present those in a systematic manner. Um, and I will uh, show to you that uh, a, a possible and uh, I think most uh, interesting uh, analysis would be where the second imperfective is built on the first one. And then the second uh, expresses specifically habitual when that second imperfective is available at all. So, uh, an example. Audada imugun. Now that bull was swallowing people. The basic verb that we're dealing with here is in the third uh, sentence. Lo hai clear dasi gana go. That's the verb go, swallow. But this sentence 1a, audada imugun, is uh, um, expanded, the gu is expanded with a, a derivation in m. Well, the m is in this sentence an n, but that is because of the third person masculine marking. And relating to the bull, uh, I see that uh, my glosses are not perfectly aligned, but I think we'll have to deal with that throughout the presentation. Uh, we are in all these examples uh, interested in the verb. Uh, we have to say that there are other elements in the, in the sentence that, that are uh, verbal in nature, like this uh, selector. In this case, it's the i. Audada i, mukkuun, glossed here with the three, third person subject. In the second uh, example, it's gana, indicating the object and the past tense. Uh, I won't talk about this much. At one point, I'll have to refer to it. So we are always concentrating on the verb. We have the gu in 1c, then the derived imperfective gu'un in uh, 1a. In expressing here that it, that it took some time, was now swallowing people, a progressive kind of uh, meaning. In 1b, uh, there is a derivation of that gu'un namely that the penultimate consonant is reduplicated. The penultimate of Gu'un is this funny stroke, the, the, the slash that stands for the, the ein, the, the voiced uh, French fricative in Iraq. So, She used to swallow all the tools and vessels. So, this is Ama Ermi that we're talking about famous ochre that uh, eats everything that is in our way. So uh, the crucial thing about Gua'in is we get a long vowel here because the third person feminine is a subject here, but there's a reduplication. The, the ein is reduplicated and the, the vowel between that is the long A. 
And this one is built on the one in 1A one on Gu'un. So we have two imperfective uh, forms for this uh, one verb gu. Gu'un, first imperfective indicating progressive, and gu'ain in 1B, the second imperfective that indicates a habit. That is uh, the, the first illustration of the imperfective. But that is not the only way to form the imperfective, because in example 2, a here, mu amankartaka gana gaai. The same progressive meaning is now not expressed by the suffix uh, with m, with the nasal, but it's uh, expressed by the reduplication of the penultimate. Um, so the, the thing that we have here, the problem that we are dealing with is that the progressive for some verbs is, uh, is expressed with the, um, the, the ending in the, in the nasal and for some other verbs it's expressed by the reduplication. And we will see a number of other ways uh, during the, the presentation in which that can be expressed. The base uh, verb of this one is in the last example again, gawek with the Im, uh, imperative, look after your cattle, with the base verb, gao. Um, I will not discuss to be at this moment. Uh, we will come to those examples later. Uh, why don't we use this uh, derivation in M for the progressive all the time? Well, sometimes it is not available and um, it can, for example, not be available like in uh, verbs like yam. So in 3b, we have the verb yam to agree. Uh, we cannot make um, a progressive in m with this verb because that would look like there are that uh, the progressive is there twice. Not that Ya'am contains a progressive, but it ends in M. And there is this restriction in, in uh, Iraku that you don't have the same, the same uh, uh, ending verbal derivation uh, twice. And it goes a bit further. You also don't do that if there is, if the verb looks as if it ends in that derivation, like we have in the case of Ya'am. So uh, verbs like yaam that end in m that could inform, that look in form as if they have, they contain this progressive uh, suffix in m, cannot get a progressive by adding an m. So what do you do? You uh, you reduplicate the penultimate. So they did not even want to tend the cattle in three a tam de ing yukwa ka ya anaka. We have this first imperfective now, not formed by the, by the derivation in M, but by the reduplication. Um, so we have this in the, I take for, I take, I must say that first of all, I take all my examples from stories and I do that because in the stories we know sort of what the context is. And I also do that because it's very difficult to, uh, to discuss uh, these things through elicitation. Um, that is because it is uh, about uh, aspects. So you don't know what kind of context people have in mind when you, when you work in, uh, in elicitation. Uh, but in the stories, at least, you know uh, what the context is, what has happened and what is meant. So this is an example from uh, the story of the hare and the cock. And uh, the cock has this time outwitted the hare. And at the end of the story, when he didn't get up, when the, the poor hare didn't get up, the wife of the hare, she ran to the cock. So we have the, he was not getting up, 
He was trying to, but he didn't get up. Tlatlai, we have the imperfective here, again, by the reduplication of the penultimate uh, consonant. Um, in that same story, a few lines uh, before that, actually, the wife waited for three days. Here we see uh, that the, the imperfective is, is uh, realized by an ending in, in M. And I'm illustrating now a few sentences of the same story, which all have this imperfective marking, but by, by different morphological means. In, in this example, why, what is it crying? Why, why are you, why is the child crying? Uh, the verb uh, is amin, and the base of this verb is a. So the, the first imperfective in this case has an ending amim, yet another way to form the first imperfective. This is the example of this uh, same verb without any imperfective marking. The first uh, derivation that we have seen that can take different shapes, what it does, it indicates the durative or the progressive aspect. But what we can show with more examples is actually that it can show any, any uh, meaning aspect of, of the imperfective can also be used for inchoative, it can be used for habitual, can be used for anything that is within the large imperfective domain. But it's not an obligatory category. So the Iraqi speaker has a choice whether to express this, the, the situation as being imperfective or not. So my analysis for the, for the formation of imperfectus is like this. If we have a lexeme, you build your first imperfective and there are a number of different ways to do that. And that is lexically determined, but we can, we can uh, say a bit more about that. And the meaning of that first imperfective is the general imperfective meaning, the whole range of it. On the basis of that, for a number of verbs, for many verbs, you can form a second imperfective by reduplicating the penultimate consonant. And that second imperfective has the specialized meaning of habitual. Habitual is included in the, in the general imperfective meaning. So also the first imperfective can actually be used in situations that are habitual. So uh, this first imperfective in M, that can be used for the present in, in the situation, can be used for an action to start now or in the immediate future, can also be used for situations that, that refer to the nature of things, to the general character. And for all of these, I have examples that I skip in the presentation for the same verb, ayin, in various stories in my collection. The second imperfective of the same verb, uh, I, so built on ayim, reduplication of the penultimate, ayayim, is used for a habit or general situation. Bobo and I always eat together. Uh, notice this, uh, this verb in this sentence here. I, I man, the ending an is for the first person plural, but I want to, to, to you to notice the, the al, the all that is here as a prefix to the, to the verb, meaning together. It will come back, the same verb will come back with a different meaning and a different uh, paradigm. There is a third uh, formation that I won't say too much about. I will dub it the, the distributive and it is formed by the reduplication of the of the initial uh, consonant or the initial syllable. So here, al -ai -ai, it has a correctional sense in this example that the supu that they were eating 
there was a lot of soup and they ate it, all of it, because the two boys that are eating this were absolutely uh, at their ends and very hungry. I, I just mentioned to you, pay attention to this uh, uh, prefix al, because we have the verb I to eat, al I to eat together, but al I also has the, the specialized lexicalized meaning of to deceive. In this, in this meaning, so the same verb, but with a different meaning, you get a different uh, series of imperfective derivations. So here the first imperfective for to deceive would be al-agim and al-agagim. The, uh, the g is actually the, the historical origin of this y in al-ai. So these are old forms that, that still exist and are used only for the lexicalized form of al-ai. Interesting complexity that for same verb in different senses, you get different paradigms in the imperfective uh, area. Um, this so uh, was the first way to, to make this uh, first imperfective with the ending M that we've seen several times now, but there's actually another ending that we can use for the first imperfective and that is the ending T. So from aware, he is climbing down the rocks, audit. So the crucial thing here is now the final T and that indicates that we are talking about the first imperfective here, the progressive, he's climbing down, he is doing this uh, for a while. So when do you use the, uh, the, the T? I have a list of verbs here. Uh, that are just lexically marked that with these verbs, the first imperfective has to be in a T. It cannot be in EM. Uh, I've, I've looked at this uh, list quite a lot. I, I, I won't keep it here on your screen as long as I've been looking at it. The thing is that I have not found any semantic characterization of this group of verbs that would predict when to use the T and when to use the M. Well, there are a number of verbs that happen to end in T, like akut, to jump. And if that's the case, then uh, you have to put the, you use the, the imperfective in M, but you have to put it before it, you have to infix it. Because there's a strict order of these uh, derivational uh, suffixes in Iraku and the M has to come before the T. I'm not saying that akut is, is uh, derived. Akut is just that root, akut, ending in a T, but it looks as if it ends in a derivation T. And that is enough to, to warrant uh, the, the in, infixation of M if you want to add the M. And this is a kind of sentence that will come back several times in the presentation things that look as if they are derived by a certain derivation and then certain things have to happen. So this is actually uh, now a subcategory of this first way of doing the, the imperfective aspect, the, the one by M, but now it has to come in a different place because of that uh, uh, kind of templatic restriction on how the verbal derivations in Iraku have to be ordered. So we have seen two types now, the M and the T, special kind of M that becomes before the T. But now uh, we come to the third one that we actually have also already seen, the reduplication of the penultimate. So alem, alelem, it's a, a, should be an A, don't know about that. Ale ya'am, ale ya'am, amahu'um, amahu'um, aram, araram. Maybe uh, 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 you have already noticed that all these bases end in an M. And this is the structural uh, reason mentioned before that we cannot add a second M to these uh, verbs. So we 
form we we form the sec the first step effective by the reduplication of the penultimate. And uh, these are a number of verbs that also form their first implication, uh, first imperfective by the reduplication of the penultimate. Gaudu, gaudadu, huailu, huailulu, gaau, gaau, mau, mamau, glau, glaglau, with a spelling mistake, sorry, bau, babau, kau, kakau, etc. Um, I've added these first ones, gaudu, to become difficult so that you see that gawit, the adjective gawit, difficult, can be formed to a verb, make a verb with the ending u. So the u is a, a verbalizer, it's an incoative, and all the other verbs, gao, mao, klau, bao, kao, klau, lao, etc., they, in a way, look as if they contain this incoative uh, ending w. And that could be brought up as a, as a motivation that apparently in Iraq, uh, as soon as you have that kind of inchoative or already imperfective derivation on it, the, the suffixation in M is excluded and we, we form the, the first imperfective by the reduplication of the penultimate. Uh, this has a tiny variant uh, because it's not uh, complex enough. We can also have the reduplication not with a but with e. So for the verb tiin, tiin, that is the first imperfective. Uh, and then if you want to form the second imperfective for these verbs, you simply change the, the added e in the reduplication to a. So the second imperfective still looks the same like all those other uh, second imperfectives as if the penultimate is reduplicated with the addition of the R. But in terms of formation, it is actually slightly different. So this is a group of, of, of verbs that work like that, that have a first derivation with the E instead of the A in the reduplication. Um, so far, I had a kind of a story why we would have this kind of uh, formation for the first imperfective or that one. Although for the M against the, the T, that was, that was just uh, lexically motivated. But here we have a number of other of verbs for which I have no story, but they do have their first imperfective in the reduplication of the penultimate consonant. So, but I don't have a story, but I have an observation. I have an observation that all of these, I think I don't have more examples than these, except for one, end in a pharyngeal or glottal consonant. Except for the Ilawats, they all end in such. I don't know why I think that is an observation that that, uh, that that should uh, inspire us to look at uh, at the history of uh, of the language to understand why we have these in a way exceptional uh, reduplications of the penultimate as a marker of the first imperfective and this is really the first, this this very tiny group of, of of verbs that do a first imperfective by in in fixation of R. Weird, it's not so weird. This is just a historical accident. So what has happened, you will notice that the roots of these verbs start with the D, da, da, and harda. The har is a prefix. So it's derived from the first one, from da. These ones, they are based the first imperfective is based on the reduplication of the penultimate, so that should be give, should have given da da. But the de between vowels has become an r historically, and so now we get something that looks like an infix, but is a relic of a former reduplication. Uh, are you still there? Yeah, following it? Yes. Okay. Um, 
there's more complications to it. Um, there are also a number of uh, verbs that form the first uh, imperfective with a double formation, the reduplication plus the suffix M or the reduplication plus the suffix T. And I have a list here. Uh, in the last column of this table, I have the blocking form because for a number of these verbs, I have a sort of a story for most of them, I don't. But for, for ba, the first one, um, the first imperfective is not simply the adding of the arm, but it must be formed by reduplication plus the adding of the arm or by arm plus the reduplication because the ba'am, the one that would be the regular um, first imperfective form of ba, has lexicalized to a meaning to be, to be lucky instead of to, to win all the time. Well, it's nearly the same, isn't it? So um, the, the fact that there is a, a specialized meaning, a lexicalization, could be given here as a motivation why this first imperfective is, uh, is out and we have to uh, do something to form something that can function as the first imperfective in this style, this case, reduplication of the penultimate. And then um, we have uh, a suffix amim. Uh, I could say all sorts of things that what I think has happened historically here. I won't do that. Let me just for the moment say there's a suffix amim to make the first imperfective. If I look through my examples, I can also see some clear tendencies. There are some verbs with a sound emission, some excretions, some senses, and then some that I don't have to, anything to say about in, in, semantically. So there seem to be some kind of subgroups within this group that, that use the amin. Um, it's probably some, yeah, that some of these, these verbs, they, uh, they, they, they act like magnets in the, in the lexicon that verbs that are similar in meaning end up having a similar formation of this first imperfective. And then, and I think this is the last one, I also have a first imperfective uh, realization by the complete reduplication and an ab in between. C, C, R, C, kloof, kloof, a kloof, etc. Is this the last one? Well, uh, yeah, in my presentation it is, but there are even more forms in my uh, lexical files that, that don't fit in any of these. How many categories that I've given to you? Quite a few, I think seven or so. Um, the, this this yeah, multitude of markers, um, looks very complex. It's certainly complex for, for me as a researcher, uh, certainly complex for me if I try to, to speak Iraq. The question is, uh, why is there this complexity and is it, is it a problem, this complexity? So as I've given the, uh, the, um, the analysis is that all of these different formations have one single function, meaning to express the whole domain of the uh, of the imperfective, that already gives quite some regularity in the whole setup. Um, uh, I've also shown to you that yes, there are some tendencies in these different forms for the first imperfective. So um, it is it is not completely impossible uh, to to learn which imperfective to use, but for the hearer. Uh, it is, okay, this, this is the slide for the, for the producer, the first imperfective. Okay, you have to know whether you do it in M or in T, but that is a limited list of verbs that have to, to take the T, the T uh, imperfective. Then there are all these uh, structural restrictions. And then for some others, there are some different ways to do it. I must say though, that not everybody does the same thing forming these imperfectives. So you can you can you can meet people who, who use 
slightly different in perspective uh, compared to their neighbor or somebody living somewhere else. Um, there is some variation there uh, across speakers. And for the hearer, I think that is not really a problem because they will, they will recognize all these things as imperfective derivation. The second imperfective derivation the that is always the reduplication of the penultimate. And because of that, it is clearly no longer available if the penultimate reduplication is already in use as the first derivation. There's a strong tendency not to have the same formation twice in the Iraqu verb. So in those cases, with those verbs, the second imperfective doesn't exist. That doesn't uh, give a problem because the first imperfective will always cover the complete imperfective semantic domain. So you can still say all these things. You don't have it, simply don't have a dedicated way to express that. This reduplication of the initial consonant or initial is uh, different. It doesn't, uh, it's not part of that imperfective system in a way and will always uh, um, mean a distributive or a productional kind of situation. The meanings of these imperfective, I've said it several times, the whole semantic domain. So a list again, durative or progressive, for an extra long period or emphasizing that it is happening now. It's also used for the immediate future starting now and in a coative uh, kind of uh, meaning. Um, but also for actions that take a while and that, that are brought to the completion for the repetition of events, for the habit, for general situations, productionality of the object and for intensity. So. A quite a broad uh, a range of meanings and uh, covering the whole domain of the imperfective meaning. Whereas the second imperfective, if I go through all my examples, through all my stories, is more restricted in meaning for the habit or general situation, sometimes for the repetition of the event or within the event, those are two meanings that can be uh, also uh, attributed to uh, projectional events. And then the last one for intensity. Meanings of the distributed initial one I've just mentioned. Uh, how am I in time? Oh, I'm, I've been used to quite some time already. Um, this is something that I don't understand. Uh, I have to look at this a lot. I have to do some more research on this. But um, the, the issue is that we see these sentences one to four, Efrim a wawat, or Efrim a wawat. So in the, when, the, when the selector is a, because in sentence three and four, the selector is ina, so the a is a selector which I analyze as a kind of perfect uh, tense aspect, aspect, and, uh, and the na is more as a marked past tense aspect, tense more. Um, that difference that, that makes also a difference in what kind of uh, imperfective uh, you can use. In this, in this example, with the reduplication of the of the penultimate. The second imperfective is that same reduplication, but now with a long a. So, Ephraim in a wa wat in number three, we have the second imperfective. Ephraim had the habit of going home. But I cannot make that same verb. I cannot use it with the a instead of the ina, which is in sentence two. I cannot say Ephraim a wa wat can only say if from our what. These are some data that are puzzling me. I uh, have to look much uh, closer to the correlation between the spectral marking on the selector and the aspect that is marked on the verb itself. Okay. Um, 
I will now go into the different constellations of imperfective forms in one lexeme. I have already told you that the same verb with different meanings can have different imperfective paradigms. That is also true for verbs that are clearly related but slightly different, ultimately etymologically with the same origin, uh, but different meanings. And here you also see different paradigms for the imperfective. Mahat, mahamamit, if it means mahat to run with speed. Mamahat to bend down because of the wind, then the imperfective will be mamahamit instead of mahamamit. <coughs> Sorry, if we if we start with mamahat to go go to hide oneself, then the first imperfective is uh, mamahamamit. If you notice, mamahat to go and hide your, oneself is very clean, close to mamahat difference in the vowel length of the first vowel, but that's all. Uh, but different meaning and different imperfective paradigms that we see all through the lexicon. <clears throat> Again, with the, the duch and duchut, duch to throw out, duchum, duchachim, but duch to marry a woman, duchum and duchachim, with a long u, and duchut, to be married, that's, uh, you say of a woman, of course, Duchut duchachit, that is the first and only imperfective form of that verb. So, yet another illustration that if the meanings are sufficiently different, then we get different imperfective uh, markings. I talk now about uh, another kind of uh, constellation of the imperfective. Namely, the first and the second imperfective. Do all verbs have an imperfective? No. I also told you it's not obligatory. So also, this is clearly in the realm of, of derivation. There are verbs that simply don't have any imperfective marking. You have to do that uh, with other means if you want to express that. There are quite a few verbs that have one. There are two, uh, there are verbs that have two with their second built on the first. And I've mainly talked about uh, number two and three so far. But sometimes there are a number of verbs that have two first imperfectives that have no difference in meaning. I mentioned to you that people can have different preferences to make their imperfective and they can then have a second one or some cannot have a second one etc. So there are quite a number uh, of constellations in, in, in different kind of, uh, of situations of verbs and their imperfective formation. I, I have uh, mentioned this before, and this is one of the, the fascinating aspects of this whole uh, verbal uh, derivation in, in, in Iraku, that we get this morphological issue that if something looks like a derivation, then it excludes that derivation. So verbs with a lexicalized T, like in alkiit, to narrate, from alki to repeat, uh, they allow an infix durative M, alkmit. So um, this is complex what, uh, because what the Iraqi speakers do is very interesting. They, uh, they go in separate ways for, for meaning and for form. So for form, they, they see that this verb ends in a T, so if you want to have an M, it has to become before the T, so you end up with alkmeet. At the same time, they know you can only add an M because this T is not a suffix. Because if it were the, the imperfective suffix, then there is no need for, it, for the imperfective M because you already have that imperfective. So, uh, at the, at the semantic level, they have to recognize that the, the, the T is really part of the base. And at the form level, they have to real, uh, recognize that the T 
could be an ending so that you put the M at the right place. It's quite complex and interesting that, that the meaning and, and this meaning and form go separate ways. And it is true for verbs that haven't happened to end in T, akut, akmit. I've mentioned that example. Is it now just the form, just the phonology that it ends in T? No, it's really also morphological consideration that it ends in something that could look like the derivation T. Because monosyllabic verbs that end in T, they are too short to look as if they are derived. So they are excluded from all of this. So it's, it's not a phonological thing, it's really a morphological motivated condition. Uh, so uh, again, ex extension of this idea, we have seen that the verbs that end in au don't allow the derivation in m, and my motivation there was that because they look like as if they, they have this, uh, this incoative in, uh, in w. But the verbs that end in au with a long a, they don't belong to this group. Uh, because the incoative will never have a long vowel. So again, the condition is not phonological, but really morphological. It really should be looking as if it could be one of those endings. A little bit addition to this, we have seen this for the M and the T, but that this also extends to the, to the S, causative S. Achas, to, uh, to listen, achnis be listening. The S is the causative, achas is not built on a base without uh, S, so the, the S just, the verb, let's say, happens to end in S, but according to the template, the M has to occur before the S, so it has to be infixed. And uh, akut, akmit, typo there, should have the initial I. We have, uh, we have seen that example before. So this, this kind of uh, reasoning is all through the derivation uh, of the verbs in Iraku, not only for the uh, imperfective domain, but for all verbal derivation. Well, how much is this a burden on the hearer? Not that much, I think, because a certain form can always be recognized as a first imperfective. If you have endings in need, in, in, in reduplication plus im, in amin, all those forms that end, that have the e plus a reduplicated consonant or the short a, reduplicated consonant plus a, they are all unambiguous signs for the hearer that the form in question is an imperfective derivation. And part of this that we can recognize that is to the exclude the fact that the same derivation cannot happen twice in the verb, and we know that and this strict order of affixes. So we recognize this, the hearer can say, okay, this is a first, uh, or this is an imperfective derivation. Um, okay, of course, it can happen. Suppose that for one speaker, a second derivation does not exist, then she may use the first derivation for these situations as habits. That's because first derivation covers the whole domain of the imperfective. And it doesn't pose any problem to the hearer. Um, but if a, s a speaker uses a second imperfective or makes one on the spot, it will always be recognizable as such and it will be interpreted as indicating a habit or maybe extra ex expressiveness of intensity. And in, it may be at most be recognized by the hearer as an innovation on, on the part of the speaker but it won't hamper the interpretation in any way. Yeah, I think this, these are the things that I have just said. Is it the case that paradigmatic meaning excludes productivity? And it, that you, you could think like that because a new derived, derived form Paradigmatic meaning, what do I mean with paradigmatic meaning? I mean that you, you have to know what other 
uh, forms exist in the paradigm in order to know the exact meaning in a way that is in, in, in a yeah in a way that would be true for the situation in Iraq. You have to know whether it's a first or a second uh, imperfective derivation to know exactly what it's uh, what it expresses. And uh, the idea of paradigmatic meaning is in some theories of uh, of morphology excluded because some theoreticians of morphology will say that there is no memory in in, in morphological derivation in Iraq who I think to some extent this, this clearly is um, but this uh, idea of paradigmatic meaning is not a problem for productivity because as we have seen it's not ruled out it still can happen in Iraq and all the innovations they they can never pose a problem in the uh, in interpretation and I've just argued in the previous slide. Is it strange to have this kind of uh, uh, complexity? Well, I think it's not so uncommon to have complex subsystems of a language with many different lexically determined morphological formations for the same meaning. Actually, in Iraq and a number of other Kushitic languages, we also have it for plural formation. All kinds of different plurals all mean the same thing, can all be recognized as plural. Uh, we, can, we can make up new, th new plurals and they will be easily recognized as a plural and they can live side by side. I have tried that once I, uh, in, the, in a long time ago. I came up with some uh, nonsense words and I convinced my, uh, my speaker that yeah, this is a very specific insect. Maybe you haven't heard of it, but I think it does. I got it from some old man, I think it exists. Can you make the plural? Well, you know, the plurals that I got with those words is, is uh, mesmerizing. I got all sorts of new plurals instead of a more uh, coherent system that I was uh, after. I, so complexity, uh, especially I think in, the, in situations um, where the like the pro formation pro is not always uh, compulsory. You can you can use a general form. Here the imperfective derivation is expressive. It's not compulsory. You don't have to use it as long as it's recognizable. What the function is, um, those those uh, subsystems will allow for a lot of complexity. In Dutch, actually also in German, to a lesser extent in English. We have this for names of uh, people of the city. Is somebody from Utrecht an Utrechtenaar, an Utrechter, or a Bredana? Uh, sometimes I hear these formations that I know, oh, I wouldn't say that, but I immediately understand what the person means, somebody from that city. So here too, we have variation among speakers. In standardization, we need we need lists and yeah, we have to look up what is actually the correct form but if we don't uh, care about standards then this bewildering variety of forms and productive productivity is is not disturbing uh, uh, the the interpretation at all ah i'm ready i'm done okay Thank you um, for this very interesting presentation. Then I think we're gonna have some time for questions. So anyone who has a question or a comment can just write them in the chat function and I will read them out. Uh, and to give you guys some time to do that, I'll start with my own question. Um, so when it comes to the exclusion of verbs that look like they're derived, mm -hmm. um, how would this work with uh, well other parts? So you have on slide 39, the causative S. Yeah. Um, or at least a verb that looks like it's ending in a causative S because that's the way the verb looks. Yeah. But if, if you want to make a causative out of that verb, what kind of strategy would you employ? Okay. Uh, I think the, those verbs that look as if they already contain a causative uh, cannot get another causative. And 
would the same go for the, the verbs ending in T who, if that they is, were a middle voice, for example? Nice question. Yes, indeed, it would. We cannot okay. get akutut, akutit, that can't exist. Achasis, axis, no. It's interesting because other Cushitic languages, they have no problem at all in, 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 in adding causatives to causatives. Two is no issue, three sometimes is possible. But the Iraqu doesn't, doesn't allow a sequence of the same uh, derivation, not even the sequence of things that could be, in a way, seen as the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then I'm just going to look at the chats. I have one comment from Crispina, but I'm not sure which slide it is. Um, but she she has a she thinks she has a correct form for quanta quatim, um, but I'm not sure about the slide. So maybe if she can find that, then Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, that that puts it in 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 another of these uh, categories of the first imperfective. So I may be at seven different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of groups. And um, yes, I'm, uh, I think it's very that, that some of these, actually I, I've been uh, moving verbs to, to these different categories all the time. Every time I work with somebody else and I have to move some of them. So um, yes, I'm happy with this and it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't change the general picture because it's still in one of the, the groups that, that, that I have there, yeah. Okay. Then I'm gonna go on to a question by Augustino. Um, he wishes to know if the reduplication pattern on imperfective occurs also in other aspects of Iraq. Um, yes. Yes, it's also one of the plural formations that is that works with the reduplication of the penultimate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there are. Uh, it's 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 always a um, yeah a challenge with re reduplication. Uh, so the strange thing is with reduplication that the different reduplications are really formatives that have their specific function or meaning and 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 yet all these different reduplications they they look so similar and that is a morphological challenge yeah yeah but you you do have them in the in the core formation of uh, of of nouns that one just a few not many And I'm coming to which I think is going to be the last question by Andrew Harvey. It's quite big, so I'm going to read it out. Um, these verbs that look derived, as you've mentioned, but are seemingly underived, really interesting. Working from a perspective of Korowa, closely related language, I would really like to explain or explain away these forms by seeing them as historically derived forms, but whose original stem verb has fallen out of usage. And then he gives the example of the im to run is based on a verb t that no longer exists. Do you think that this is a reasonable line of inquiry to follow? If so, do you have any thoughts on how I could explore this further? Um, for example, whether it, these proposed verb forms like the proposed T were historically valid forms but are no longer? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think that this is a, a huge job uh, to, to undertake and, uh, and luckily uh, there is some of it uh, can can be used uh, based on the, the the historical reconstruction that has been done specifically in in, in Roland's uh, morphological reconstruction of the of the whole certain Cushitic group. Um, it, he doesn't have all the all the um, the verbs there, but he has so many examples that that quite a few you would get some information also about Alakwa and Burungi in the, in this respect. And yes, that is something that, that we, we have to do, especially if we want to, um, to, uh, to relate these, these roots to uh, what I want to do in my project, to relate them to, uh, to forms in languages, but not in Tanzania. It is both in the verbal system and in the nominal system 
And I think in the nominal system is even more complex than in the inverse system. We have this task to, to scrape off all these layers of, of morphology that have become reinterpreted re and have become lexicalized, take them up one by one and to see uh, what's really left and, and what is the, 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 the root of the, the historical root, like here, T. Uh, in order to uh, to look outside of uh, Tanzania and Cushitic, where we have the same problem in, in East Cushitic uh, in, in uh, Ethiopia, where we also have to scrape off all that innovation that 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 happens time and time again, like lexicalization on the basis and new formation, etc., in order that we can actually compare the lexical roots. Does that answer your question? I think so. I don't see any response from Andrew at this point. So that think that means he's satisfied. Yeah, he says it's a good start. Okay, thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I think those are all the questions and comments for today. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that the recordings of all of the presentation in the Rift Valley webinar uh, series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page. And entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Uh, looking ahead, the next presentation in the webinar series will be given on Wednesday, November 13, by Crispina Alphonse, and it is titled Iraqu Personal Names and Naming Practice. Um, wow. I would just like to thank Martin again for the presentation and everyone else for participating, and I hope to see you again at our next seminar.